ignorant of the facts of the case, willfully ignorant, uh, as I think many Austrians sometimes are of the, the Nazi period, uh, you know, even though painting, taking paintings was a very small portion of what the Nazis did, it, how is it possible that, at a, that a minister of education can make that type of mistake? The government committee found in favor of the Belvedere Gallery, and Minister Goerer endorsed their decision. I think Minister Goerer was uh, convinced that Austria has got the right to keep the pictures. She didn't look at any other possibility. She just thought this is the way uh, it has been handled in the past and the law is on our side and why should we give the pictures back? Because in the will of uh, Adele Blochbauer it said uh, it, the pictures should actually be given to the Belvedere Gallery after her death. The five disputed paintings were part of the largest collection of Klimt's in the world. The Belvedere had a total of 25 on show. They were national icons. Some said the portrait of Adele meant as much to Austrians as the Mona Lisa did to the French. Klimt was an Austrian painter portraying his native countryside and the people of Vienna. For any tourist, the Klimt collection was one of the must-sees on their visit, adding huge amounts to the Austrian economy. I wrote them the nicest letters. I told them that I don't want to take those paintings away from Austria. But um, we have an English proverb I wrote in German that is saying, where there's a will, there's a way. And if you want to work with me, we can find a way that the paintings remain there. They never even bothered to answer the letter. After Minister Goerer had blocked any further discussion over the restitution of the five Blockbauer Klimts, Randy wrote to her directly, saying in all fairness, she should consider arbitration. And her response to me was in writing, uh, if you don't like the way we've dealt with the law, you have to go to court. The Austrians must have felt confident that Randy and Maria wouldn't sue in Austria, as Maria would have to put down a large deposit reflecting the value of the painting. But they hadn't bargained for the tenacity of the American lawyer. In this case, it would have been almost several million dollars for Maria just to initiate a lawsuit. So we tried to reduce that, and the, and the judge said, well, yes, Maria Altman, you don't have to pay more than all everything you own. You just have to pay everything you own. And literally all of her assets other than her, than her home, she would have had to pay to start the litigation in Austria. And then Austria appealed and said the amount should be even higher than that. So at that point, <laughs> let's forget about suing in Austria. Let's see if we can sue in the United States. That was something Austria never thought possible. If Randy couldn't fight them in Vienna, he would fight them in his hometown, Los Angeles. Randy needed to bring pressure to bear on the case. He got to work making sure that the world knew about the injustices inflicted on the Blockbauer family. One of the papers he turned to was the Los Angeles Times. I went over to Randall's office to meet the lawyer. He was in his early 30s. He looked like he just graduated from college. He was pacing around the office and pulling books out of bookshelves, showing me pictures, spreading things out like characters from a Russian novel. And um, I remember standing there thinking, huh, uh, this, this is a kind of case that's untested. I mean, I wouldn't say I thought it was a lost cause, but I certainly thought it was a case for which there was no legal precedent in the United States. But how could he sue Austria? He searched and searched for a way. Then he found that if he could prove that Austria made money out of the Klimt paintings in the US, he might have a chance. And Austria, of course, had cashed in on posters and books about the artist. I thought, I think we can file a lawsuit here in Los Angeles. Maria Altman's been a citizen here for 60 years. She should have the right to have her courts decide this legal issue between her and Austria. So I filed the complaint in August of 2000, and it didn't cost $2 million to file the complaint. It cost a few hundred. I think people thought it was sort of a quixotic 
effort, you know, that I was tilting at windmills and, and, you know, to take on the Austrian government and sue in the United States to try to get back paintings that were in Vienna seemed a little bit nuts, I must say. And I think most people uh, who were looking at it thought I was a little bit crazy. But when I won the district court, people started taking a little more notice. But, you know, crazy things happen in the district court. It'll get corrected on appeal. Uh, but when I won in the Court of Appeal, then people started to really pay attention to the case. Six years after taking on the case, Randy's determination took him before the judges of the Supreme Court. The Austrian government had the resources to fight the case all the way to the highest court in America. Very few cases go to the Supreme Court, just about 80 cases per year, and so very rare that you'd get a private litigation like this going to the Supreme Court, and you know, you can count on, on a few hands the number of people in Los Angeles who get to, get to do that type of thing. But as the date for the Supreme Court hearing grew nearer, Randy found he wouldn't just be fighting the Austrians. A number of other countries, including the Bush administration, wrote legal briefs uh, basically supporting Austria's contention that the case shouldn't go forward in U.S. courts, that the U.S. was not the proper jurisdiction. Many countries don't want to see themselves in the same position where they're being sued in a foreign court over in a historic grievance that's 50 years old. I think probably many U.S. judges don't want to see those kinds of cases uh, regularly in U.S. courts. Um, so. Basically, when he went to go argue against the argue against Austria in the U.S. Supreme Court, the Bush administration had already cast a vote that was supportive of Austria. On February 25, 2004, Randy finally had the chance to take on both the Austrian and his own government before the Supreme Court. He's not a big guy, you know, and there's this huge room uh, of the courtroom, you know, and there the, on this podium sat the judges, and then little Randy walked up there, you know. But Randy was desperate not to be overawed by the occasion. I went up last after the U.S. government and the Austrian government argued. And so I got up, and you don't prepare a speech in the Supreme Court because they always interrupt you. So you, I just had a general outline of what I wanted to say, and I said, there are four grounds for affirming the Ninth Circuit. Ground one is, and then boom, I got interrupt, interrupted by Justice Souter. And he asked me this long, long question, convoluted, twisting and turning question, da 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 like that. And all of a sudden, the question was over, and he's looking at me, and I had not the slightest idea what he had just asked me. Not, not a clue. All I could think of saying was, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I, I don't think I understood the question. Could you please rephrase it? And, and there were these gasps in the audience, you know. And, but the other justices were so nice, they all smiled as if to say, oh, don't worry, he does that all the time. Or, you know, thank goodness you asked because we didn't understand it either. It was a turning point. Far from being a blunder, Randy had succeeded in endearing himself to the court. That opened everything for him because all the other judges smiled. From that moment, he had the judges on his side. It must have had a good impact, and it just seemed really, at the end of it, it seemed like we had a chance of winning, which was a big surprise. And so I just floated out of the room, and I was so happy, and everybody congratulated me. The room was filled with men, all lawyers. They came running up to me and they said, Maria, it looks fabulous. And I said, how oh, can you tell? Nobody said anything. Randy flew back to Los Angeles, uncertain whether he had won or lost. No sooner had he arrived than he got some bad news. I got home and I opened up the legal newspaper here in Los Angeles and the headline was, Court Likely to revert Al Reverse Altman Case, that we were gonna lose. And, and so I called up the reporter 
And I said, you know, how could you say this? Everybody thought it went so well. And he said, trust me, I've been reporting the Supreme Court for 35 years. You don't stand a chance. It's all over. And I said, well, you know, some of the justices didn't even open their mouths. He says, I can tell by the body language, you lost. It was the spring when the case was heard in Washington. But it was the fall in Los Angeles when Randy finally learned the result. Three months later, I'm making breakfast for the kids and I get this call from the reporter. He says, hello, this is Dave Pike. And I said, okay, well, give me the bad news. He said, no, not bad news, you won. I said, you're kidding. He said, no, 6-3 decision by Justice Stevens. I, I literally couldn't believe it. And, but it was coming from him, I had to believe it. And so, you know, I tried to call Maria and her phone was busy and then we finally got together and just, I mean, the celebration was enormous. But very quickly we realized, wait a second, what did we just win? Nothing, right? All we won was the right to start the case in Los Angeles. The paintings are still in Vienna. We hadn't won anything. We just won the right to start. It may have been just the beginning for Randy, but the judgment put the Austrian government in a difficult position. They may have been anxious to throw off their Nazi past, but now the case had attracted media interest from around the world. Now the U.S. Supreme Court had basically weighed in and said, okay, well, you can hear it in U.S. court. U.S. courts tend to be more favorable in these cases. However, the Austrians could have appealed, as they had appealed some of the other decisions in the past. But to have this dragging on in the public view uh, during these appeals uh, as an issue that really at this point was not going to go away, I think was a very difficult quandary for the Austrians. But it wasn't just the Austrian government that was in a precarious position. Randy's client was now 89. Could he risk a lengthy court case? If she died, his case was over. She had no other relatives living in the United States who could continue the case. It took a year of negotiations, but eventually both sides agreed to a do-or-die arbitration. I went behind closed doors with Maria and I said, Maria, this is the greatest thing. We can have this arbitration. We can get it finally finished. And by your 90th birthday next February, it'll all be over with. And isn't that great? And she said, are you crazy? Why on earth would we go back to Austria when we've just been fighting for five years all the way to the Supreme Court and back to have the right to, uh, to try the case in front of this wonderful judge here in Los Angeles? I said, you're crazy. Why would three Austrian arbitrators go against their government and give us the paintings when for eight years they kept saying. And he said, we have to take the chance. Having convinced Maria, Randy flew to Vienna. The game was on. He was going to gamble everything. The Klimts were probably worth over a hundred million dollars. Who had the strongest hand? Randall was very skillful at uh, getting his side of the story out. I think he was more skillful uh, than the Austrians in articulating his position in the media. So when the panel was deciding this case, it was another period of months and months that went by where they were still in this limbo. And you kind of thought anything could happen. Once again, Randy had no idea whether he had won or lost. He returned to Los Angeles. Then four months later, he got an email message. I came home late one night from a neighborhood poker game where I had lost my shirt and uh, uh, checked my email. And sure enough, there's an email from the, the main arbitrator with the decision. And so I opened up the the decision and it's all in German, you know, and, and my German's pretty good, but it took me a while until I got to the, you know, the part where they said we won. And it was, I was, you know, obviously overjoyed, but it was, like midnight, it was after midnight uh, on a Sunday night, Monday morning. So I didn't call Maria right away. I let her sleep and, uh, and then in the morning we really, cel this time we really celebrated. It <laughs> <laughs> was very, very exciting. I did not expect it. I was hoping, but I, because I couldn't imagine, and I still think it is incredibly 
just that these three Austrian judges